This perilous journey, I travel to India's Himalayan mountains to take on one of the world's highest drivable roads, Kardungla. Adrenaline's definitely pumping. I'm Mosh Mukhtari. It's just me, my SUV, and this narrow cliffside road. Let's hope the Hindu gods are with me right now. This path has only inches to spare, as well as ice, snow, and avalanches. Holy shit. And then I arrive in a war zone. Here, the peace is as fragile as the air is thin. India is home to more than one billion people and one of the world's fastest growing economies. But in the northernmost state called Jammu and Kashmir, these towering mountains keep this region largely isolated from the rest of the country. Here, the mountain roads are treacherous, claiming as many as 10 people each year. The twisted wreckage of a van that carried five German tourists to their deaths in 1990 reminds me of the hazards I'll face. And doing it at this time of year, winter time, just adds a whole new element of danger. My starting point is Leh, the capital of the Ladakh region. From there, it's a wild ride up to 5,500 meters and over the Kardung Pass, or La, as it's called in the local language. My final destination is 118 kilometers away in the isolated village of Diskit. This peaceful oasis sits on the edge of a military restricted zone where nuclear powers, India and Pakistan, battle for control of the region. In good weather, locals can make the drive in a day. Well, it remains to be seen how I'll do. Along the way, I edge past 600 meter drops like this. And the authorities have not installed guardrails. You can see the road is just a gravel strip and only wide enough for one vehicle. And it's barely 10 feet wide right now. Well, here I have to literally pull right to the very edge here. And I gotta be careful that he doesn't nudge me on the way past, otherwise, well, I don't even wanna think about what otherwise could mean there. Before I begin my journey, I must spend some time acclimating to the altitude. At 3,500 meters, Leh is one of the highest towns in the world, higher than any in Europe. Ladakhis call people like myself, those who live near sea level, lowlanders. And I gotta say, the mountain air is getting to me. At this sort of elevation, the altitude is a killer. That's why I have to take it easy for at least 48 hours before traveling any higher. Already the lack of oxygen is giving me a shortness of breath and giving me slight headaches. Fingertips are also tingling too. As I go up in altitude, the air will contain less and less oxygen. I'll feel lightheaded until my body adapts. During the summer, Lay bustles with adventurers and hikers. But I'm here in mid-November at this time of year, temperatures can drop as low as 35 degrees below, and heavy snowfall can clog roadways with up to 8 meters of snow. There's little information in the guidebooks about winter travel, so I seek help from an expert. Hey, Yuntan. Hi, Mars. How, How are, are you? you? Local guide Yuntan Kunskiap knows what it takes to drive this mountain. He brings me an Indian-made Scorpio SUV outfitted for my steep journey. The road rises more than two kilometers in elevation to get to the top. Locals recommend using a modified form of diesel, which helps keep the engine from stalling at low temperatures. It's equipped with new tires and specially calibrated heavy duty brakes. Indian car manufacturers often test new automotive designs in this part of the Himalayas. If a vehicle can withstand these extreme temperatures and high altitude, it's certainly ready for the consumer market. Yuntan tells me my route will take a heavy toll on my vehicle and on me. The most dangerous, treacherous part of this whole journey is where? 
The real danger zone in this stretch of the Kardongla Pass lies three kilometers to the south of Kardongla. Right here to so, here. Yeah. This section of the road, just below the pass on either side of the summit, is the most brutal part of my journey. This is the avalanche zone. Official numbers are difficult to access, but these fast-moving snow slides kill people each year in the Himalayas. Have you ever been stuck in an avalanche? Oh, yeah, I've been stuck in an avalanche twice. I see. If an avalanche buries the road and strands me, the gear I carry could mean the difference between life and death. I've got camping equipment, an emergency oxygen cylinder, and a medical kit. I also have snow chains for the tires. In ice and snow, chains add traction. Any loss of control could send me into the abyss. If I do make it to the summit of the pass, Yuntan tells me there's a victory cry. Once I hit the top, what's the phrase I need to say? Just shout, Kiki so so har gelo three times, okay? okay Kiki so, so so har gelo. Kiki so so, so har gelo. Har gelo. Har gelo, yes. Kiki so so har gelo. Har gelo yes. I may not have it quite down, but Yuntan tells me it means victory to the gods. Let's hope I remember it when the time comes. Thank ah. you so much for telling me all of this. I hope you'll have a good, a nice uh, drive all the way. Great. I stow my critical gear in the back of the SUV and head to Lay's historic marketplace to buy food, just in case I get stuck on the mountain. For hundreds of years, goods from all over Asia have come through here. Tea, tobacco, silk, and spices were just some of the products that moved in and out of Lay. But many traders did lose their lives trying to tackle these dangerous mountain passes. The local language here is Ladeki. Now, if you learn only one word, make sure it's Jule. It means hello, goodbye, please, and thank you, all rolled yeah, into yeah, one. Yeah. Jule. Jule. Yeah, go. It's 39 kilometers up to the Kardang Pass over some of the most demanding terrain in the world. Just another day at the office. For the first leg of my journey, I'll travel with a man who knows these mountains perhaps better than anyone. Former Indian Army officer and adventurer, Harish Kohli. Hey, Harish, how are you? Very good. Good, it's great to see you. Gosh. Yeah, it's a pleasure. You all ready to go? Yes, yeah, all set. Yeah. Jump on in. Harish is a legend in these parts. In 1995, he and his team became the first people to ski across the Himalayas. For 97 grueling days, they battled altitude sickness and brutally cold temperatures. Two of his party suffered severe frostbite, and one of them lost seven fingers. You have done some pretty amazing things skiing across the Himalaya. Yes. What, what drives you to do those things? You sort of get addicted to it. It is a drug called adventure. Uh, I want to grow as an individual. Right. I want to know the meaning of things and there is an urge and a desire in me to see new places. Thank goodness the skies have remained clear so far. But I need to be ready for the worst. Snowstorms materialize very quickly here. You've got enough clothing, you've got a sleeping bag, you've got your waters. Stay warm. And, and the satellite phone, just in case. And you have a satellite phone and ask for a helicopter to come and <laughs> pick you up. I don't know if I have that much clout, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> My peak driving elevation will top out at a whopping 5,500 meters, just a few meters below Europe's highest mountain peak, Mount Elbrus in Russia. The Army's helicopters can operate at that height, but if I find myself in a perilous situation, the area is so remote that I could spend days in the bitter cold before being rescued. The altitude in this area is what you've got to be careful about. Right. You should acclimatize for at least seven days before you go to a higher altitude. I haven't been on the mountain for quite that long. Experts say that a traveler here should rest for at least a few days before going any higher so I should be okay. Extreme changes in altitude affect everyone differently, so it's impossible to know how dizzy I'll get. But the most severe symptoms, like confusion and loss of balance, could be deadly. Still, I feel okay for now, so I'm gonna begin my journey up northern India's treacherous Kardung Pass. 
traveled 24 kilometers and 1,150 meters in elevation from my starting point in the city of Leh to my first destination, the Indian Army's South Pulo checkpoint. With the tensions between India and Pakistan, authorities require all vehicles to stop and register before proceeding northward. As my companion Harish Kohli and I climb into the mountains, the dangers we face become more real. Harish points out the type of terrain that generates avalanches and landslides. You can see the size of those boulders just hanging over this road here. It, it wouldn't take much to knock one of those off and I guess they would come down like cannonballs. Yeah. And this cliff here, that is easily a thousand feet to the right here. Keep an eye on the road. If you want I'll, to try, I'll try to keep an eye on the road. <laughs> I'm not making you nervous, am I? I'm always nervous on these roads. <laughs> I'd rather walk it rather than... And this, and this is coming from a man who's <laughs> skied across the entire Himalayas. No, I, I'm fine when I'm walking. Oh, when you're on your own two feet. <laughs> <laughs> 60 degree drop-offs are bad enough, but there's a man-made danger too. Military traffic. As you can see behind me, the army uses this road as a vital lifeline to the Nubra Valley. Caravans of transport vehicles dominate the road. On occasion, the military even closes the route to civilian traffic to accommodate the convoys. In 1947, when India gained independence from Great Britain, the country was partitioned into Islamic Pakistan and Hindu India. The new countries argued over the exact border. In 1984, each moved troops onto the Siachen Glacier, which is on the other side of the Kardang Pass. Both countries have nuclear weapons, and as recently as the year 2000, US President Bill Clinton called the region the most dangerous place in the world today. Harish Kohli served more than 30 years as an army officer, and he still knows people fighting on the glacier today. Getting caught up in the conflict is an ever-present risk. Still, my most pressing concern is the altitude. Harish and I pause on the way up to give me a breather. Khardumla Pass at 18,380 feet is a challenge for a drive. Like Mount Everest is to a mountaineer. You're taking a risk. I'll put it flatly. You'll have a headache, which I suppose you have it now. Right. But apart from headache, the next stage is nausea and vomiting. But the altitude is going to affect much more because you're driving up rather than walking. Right. If you get to the stage of nausea, hallucination, anything like that, I would suggest that you stop at Khardungla Pass and there is a medical post there. Get yourself checked and only then cross the pass. Perilous journey indeed. As we continue our push up the winding south face of the Cardin Pass, I find myself in awe of the travelers and traders who have made this trek along what is known as the Silk Road on foot. The Silk Road entered the Western imagination around 1300 AD when Venetian trader and explorer Marco Polo wrote an account of his travels to China. About an hour into the journey, Harish and I arrive at South Pulu, the last outpost before the top of the mountain. Harish is going to ride over the pass with an old hiking buddy. Marsh? Yes? This is the checkpoint where you have to show the passport. Okay, great. Thanks, Thanks again. Bye-bye. I'm on my own, but if I make it to the other side, Harish will show me the area where India and Pakistan still fight today. Here at South Pulu, soldiers check to see if travelers have what's known as an inner line permit. Without it, the military forbids you from crossing over the pass. The army keeps tabs on tourists coming this close to the disputed border with Pakistan. I'm only allowed to visit the other side of the mountain for a maximum of seven days. Military rules prohibit cameras in the office. Passports all checked, permit in hand, ready for the summit. I'm glad the check-in only took a few minutes. I still have plenty of time before sunset to make it over the pass and down into the Nubra Valley, where they'll check me again to 
make sure that I've actually made it over the top. If I don't make it, they know that something's, uh, something's gone awry. I'm averaging about 25 kilometers an hour around these blind curves. But some of the truck drivers barrel around at three times that speed. Now, most Indians believe in the karma school of driving, which basically means it's not your bad driving that causes accidents, it's karma. I don't know whether to be reassured by that or to be absolutely petrified. In an effort to curb reckless driving, a division of the Indian Army has erected various signs, including this one, love thy neighbor, but not while driving. Pretty good advice. On average, 100 vehicles cross the pass each day, and drunk driving is a major cause of accidents. This road definitely takes my full attention. The road has changed. The asphalt has stopped. I'm now on a dirt road. It's significantly more rocky and bumpy, and the cliff edge is easily a thousand foot sheer drop down. I stop along the way to meet with someone who went over that edge. 2005, Dawa Sering and his cousin drive to a wedding when high on the mountain, his car's drive shaft breaks. And we dissolve from the road. The car tumbles out of control. I thought I'm going to die. Yes. It looks like he's a goner. Then it rolled again like this, then we just had been thrown out of the car. Flung from the vehicle, Dawa and his cousin land on the rocky slope. If they'd remained in the car, they might have been crushed. Thank goodness you were thrown out at about 100 feet. Yeah, otherwise we are not now here like talking to you. Yeah. Dawa's experience is a chilling reminder of what can and will happen on this road. I know that any mechanical malfunction or lapse in concentration can be lethal. As a driver, I feel like I have some control, but most area residents don't have cars and must rely on another form of transportation. To get a feel for what they go through, I arrange to have a local drive my car up to the next stop, while I take the bus. This should be an adventure. Buses make this climb to 5,500 meters on a daily basis. It's a dizzying ride. Indians claim this as the highest motorable road in the world. Now, in the winter time, when the roads are very treacherous, you can't put your life in the hands of the bus driver, so I'm gonna go and do as the locals do. It's a dangerous journey, but for most lay residents, it's their only choice. Well, it looks like we've loaded up the bus pretty much to capacity here. There's no heat on the bus, and the temperature outside is about 15 degrees below, so everyone bundles up. Along the road, there are almost no modern safety measures, such as lane markings or guardrails, and the bus has a schedule to keep. Our driver, Shokat Ali Kukpa, tells me he's negotiated these tight turns and local traffic for 31 years. Resident Wang Chuk Fargo translates. So I wonder how he feels holding everybody's lives in his hands every day. He said he just drives very, very concentrated. And of course, he always think about it. Absolutely. God. So he has never had an accident? No. I hope today is not the day that his luck changes. But he said uh, it's very harsh. The roads are very, very tough. It's very shaky, it's very bumpy. Sometimes you do meet with a lot of ice, snow, landslides, you know, bridges, they just washed out. Climbing this steep grade puts a lot of strain on the engine. If it overheats and stalls, the bus could roll over the edge and kill us all. Doing some uh, quick last minute repairs, open up that to cool down the engine. Opening vents in the front of the bus lets more cool air reach the engine block. Soon, we're back in business. 
From its starting point in Leh to the top of the pass, the bus gains more than two kilometers in altitude. This rapid ascent can cause altitude sickness. And the hairpin turns fray the nerves. I notice that some of the passengers say prayers. Every little bit helps. We arrive at my stop part of the way up the mountain. I've traveled up several hundred meters and I'm feeling the effects. It's a little bit like hyperventilating. I'm just feeling a little delirious. My, my mind's not as quick as it... Some people say it was never quick. But <laughs> fingertips are certainly tingling now and my head is, um, is throbbing. I've got to take a minute to catch my breath before I retrieve my car and continue on. Oh boy. Ten minutes later, I'm back in the driver's seat and feeling much better. Now, it's time to tackle the toughest leg of my journey, the summit. I'm up at around 16,000 feet. And the lack of oxygen is not only affecting me, but it's certainly affecting my vehicle. I've noticed a significant reduction in power. My car needs oxygen for its combustion engine. Less oxygen in the air equals less power. Yeah, we're hitting a little bit more uh, rougher terrain here. Looks like the asphalt's been taking a bit of a pounding. And a lot more rocks on the road. Yeah, I've been told to beware of the army drivers on this road because they typically drive 18, 20 hour shifts backwards and forwards from the Nubra Valley to Ley. In places, the road stretches just three meters across, and trucks take up more than half that width, leaving me about 30 centimeters of clearance. But I'd rather scrape the car than face a 300 meter drop into the abyss. Okay, we're gonna try and pass this army truck right now. See if he's gonna give me weight. That was nice of him. So far, so good. I'm more than two thirds of the way to the top. Oh wow, I can see a significant amount of snow up there. It's right in between the two valleys. Every year, heavy snowfall strands drivers on the road, and when that happens, there's no telling when help will arrive. So I'm gonna do everything in my power to stay safe. They recommend that you press your horn to alert the other drivers coming into these blind switchbacks. Wow, the roads are significantly worse here. Meeting traffic on these blind switchbacks could be pretty dangerous. The road is even more constricted here, much less than the width of two cars. So I have to use one of the passing bays that pop up every two kilometers to get around other vehicles. That truck is coming fast. Let's hope that nobody swerves. If you swerve, you're either hitting some pretty large boulders to the right, or you face an even more gruesome fate at the bottom of the mountainside. The wreck below is a grim reminder that this road is a death trap. I haven't seen a passing bay in a little while. Let's hope the Hindu gods are with me right now. But as I go up, another problem arises. The car, the power has diminished. I need to give a lot more revs than usual just to get the same kind of propulsion forward. I hope it can make it the roughly 600 vertical meters left. You can definitely see snow at the top. 
Gonna wait until I'm a little closer to the top before I consider bringing out the snow chains. Imagine this road in whiteout conditions. Now that's a dangerous road. The closer to the top we get, the less maintained the road. The whiteout situation. Asphalt wouldn't be the best road surface to be traveling on when you got three or four inches of ice. Oh, I can see all the way down the lay to the left here and the snowy peaks in the distance. I feel like I'm top of the world. It feels like I'm on the moon. So we're approaching 5,330 meters and the air is considerably thinner. The dizziness, the shortness of breath has got, got worse. I haven't felt the need for any oxygen yet. That's a good sign, but I still must make it about 300 more meters in altitude. We call this section the India Gate with the two pieces of granite either side of me. Just remarkable. The boulders uphill from me look ready to roll. Landslides happen throughout the winter due to drifting snow and strong winds. I better keep an eye out for falling rock. The summit is just one challenge on my journey. Still, it's thrilling to drive at this sort of altitude. There are very few places on Earth where this is even possible. But I'm not sure this should be a two-way road. We're meeting a car head-on here. One of us has to back up. Is he going to do the honors or not? No, nope, looks like he back up just a touch. There's nowhere for me to go. Okay, looks like I'm going to have to back up. Now we are inches from the edge there. Thankfully we passed. You can hear the shortness of breath in my, in my voice here. We're approaching 18,000 feet. And um, it's, it's pretty remarkable the effects of altitude. I wouldn't have believed it otherwise, but experiencing it, Gives you a whole new level of respect for those people who tackle Everest and, and any high, high altitude expedition. I'm less than two kilometers from the top. My fingers are tingling and I'm losing some coordination. Telltale danger signs. If it gets any worse, I could pass out. I think I'm gonna pull over here because I'm starting to feel a little dizzy too. When I stop, that's when I really feel the effects. Now I'm really spinning. My head is totally going crazy. Holy shit. Back on the road, but I take it slow. It's just a little bit further to the pass. Well, it looks like I'm coming up to the top here. I'm seeing a multicolored roof. Hallelujah, I made it. I gotta remember the phrase Yuntan told me to shout. Kiki Sosolagaro! Kiki Sosolagaro! <laughs> we made it to the top. Victory to the gods. Kiki Sosolagaro! <laughs> oh, this is beautiful up here. I'm gonna park up and take a little walk around. Travelers stop to hang these colorful banners, but they're not just for decoration. They have religious significance too. These Buddhist prayer flags represent an important belief that the wind will carry their mantra in all directions, leaving travelers with only good luck. And considering I'm about to do the most dangerous part of the road, I can use all the good luck I can get. I hear there's ice on the north side descent. It's 56 kilometers to the valley, so I shouldn't spend too much time up here. Nightfall can bring temperatures as low as 35 below. At that temperature, even with special fuel, the engine could stall. And since I'm not completely acclimated, every minute up here on top of the Cardang Pass 
brings me closer to severe altitude sickness. I definitely feel the effects of being at 5,500 meters above sea level. Headache, dizziness, and a little bit of nausea. The soldiers tell me that the only surefire cure is to get to a lower elevation. Hey, thank you guys. And you know what? Julie, Julie, Julie. These guys are the real heroes up here. Stationed up here in the middle of winter. I mean, this is, this is a hot day for them. It's minus 18 degrees. I meet Colonel Sunil Moharil, an officer with the Border Roads Organization, or BRO. He and his men keep the roadway open all year round. And when they have to clear snow, the job gets much tougher. This work takes them to the very edge of cliffs that drop hundreds of meters. It's a vital job, but an incredibly tough assignment. You are effectively the guardian angel of this mountain. <laughs> Moharil tells me that an average winter sees four to eight meters of snow. This type of accumulation turns the snowpack above the road into a ticking time bomb. Avalanche came and uh, the boat also went down. Yeah, no, a couple of men also died. Two died? Yeah. So I'll be very careful on my way down from here. While I've been talking, the military shuts down civilian access to the north face of the road, prohibiting me from continuing on to Diskit, my destination in the valley below. I'm stranded. The army is actually transporting supplies from North Pulo all the way over to South Pulo. And uh, they can't tell me when they're going to open the pass back up. The altitude is really beginning to affect me. Headache's gone from a little mild headache to a pretty severe one. It's been two hours since I made it to the top, and I feel worse with every passing minute. This is exactly what I was warned about. Coupled with all that, I'm frigidly freezing. It's about minus 20 degrees. I think I'm gonna go and try and get a hit of oxygen from the army guys up here. Yeah, I thought I'd come in here and get checked out because I was feeling a little lightheaded and the altitude can creep up on you very quickly. To determine how my body is responding to the altitude, they check my blood oxygen saturation levels. 100% is optimal. Below 80 can be dangerous. Right now, mine's down to 74. I've been told to just lie down normal and uh, suck down this oxygen. At 5,500 meters, there's only half as much oxygen in every breath as there is at sea level. Doctors recommend transporting anyone with severe sickness to lower altitudes as quickly as possible. Even a few hours delay can mean death. Luckily for me, I respond well to the oxygen and haven't gotten very sick. I'm just applying more pure oxygen to my red blood cells. Headache's gone. I can think a little clearer. See, the blood oxygen levels have gone up to 100 already. So thank you very much. It's beautiful up here, but I'm anxious to get back on the road before the sun begins to set. I'm told the conditions on the north side of the mountain are worrisome. I walk down to take a closer look. I'm about 50 feet from the top of the Cardong Pass, and as you can see, the conditions are snowy and very icy. The sun barely touches this section of the mountain. When you meet oncoming traffic in a situation like this, you literally have milliseconds to react. And if you swerve, you hit sheer rock, or you go flying over the edge. Now, when you're meeting trucks like this one, no wonder these accidents can and will happen. You really don't want to be meeting one of those on a blind switchback. I head back to the pass and receive good news. I'm finally clear to leave. I've seen a lot of these trucks pulling off snow chains. I'll take their cue and use chains for my dangerous descent as well. I say goodbye to Cardungla Summit. Altitude definitely affected me. and I'm feeling it right now. I'm seeing a lot of ice, a lot of snow, and a pretty big cliff to my right-hand side. You can hear the snow chains working, gripping away. Just gotta make sure that I keep it in first gear, 
don't hit the brakes. I'm skating on one and a half centimeters of solid ice. One slip and it's the fast way down. I can see a few wrecks down there. Okay. Pulling over for a truck to pass. Very close to the edge here. And uh, all it takes is a slight nudge. Whoa, there's barely enough room. On this really dangerous section, I keep my speed down to about eight kilometers an hour. Wow, that's a sheer drop to the right-hand side. And my car is slipping and sliding. More snow. This is the exact spot where most of the avalanches occur. A large avalanche could easily wipe out a whole convoy like this one. Not to mention a lone passenger vehicle like mine. I see several army trucks coming up. I'll let them pass right here. Adrenaline's definitely pumping. about maybe a foot away from the edge here and it's barely wide enough for this semi to go past. Oh, yes. Definitely feel the tire sliding. It's just hanging over me like a big mallet, saying, make one little slip and... <laughs> it's not the kind of place for the faint of heart. Finally, I emerge from the shadow of the mountain and the sun keeps this section fairly ice-free. I can go a little bit faster now. But, again, really got to pay attention. Now, I probably descended about 450 meters and my car is already handling a lot better. I'm certainly starting to feel a little bit better too. I get more oxygen with every breath and that's good news for a lowlander like me. It's amazing, you, you see these people fixing the roads here. Trucks drop off workers each morning to spend the entire day mending potholes and removing small landslides. I need a quick leg stretch, so I stop to check out the yak. Looks like a little frozen pond in the middle there. And some yak. That's beautiful. Locals harvest their wool to make clothing. Just remarkable. The temperature's got to be around minus 20 degrees. They're very comfortable in it, I'm not. So I'm gonna head back into the car. I actually make better time descending the south face of the mountain than I expected. The conditions could have been much, much worse. It's all downhill for a bit. Although this is beautiful scenery, I mean, one wrong move. You could pop a tire, it could be any number of things that could happen here. They had a little patch of ice out of the blue. The road might be all right, but I'm heading to a region where that's the least of my worries. Last leg of my journey to the town of Diskit takes me through the Nubra Valley and close to the disputed zone between India and Pakistan. It's not the safest place for tourists. Tensions between India and Pakistan have been volatile to say the least. It's here that the two nuclear powers duel, each defending their honor and claim on this isolated patch of earth. Just a little bit further on the rugged and often icy north slope before I reach my next milestone. Right, well we're approaching the Indian Army's North Pulu checkpoint and believe me this is a welcome sight. After two hours and a nerve-wracking descent of over 900 meters, I've made it down from the Kardang Pass. I must check in with the army so they know I crossed safely. This also allows them to monitor my stay in this militarily sensitive valley, just kilometers from the fighting on the Siachen Glacier. Oh, 
Okay, all checked and ready for the Nubra Valley and onwards to Diskit. After the checkpoint, the road quality improves at long last. Pavement. And something new, there are even a few guardrails along here. The further I head to the Nubra Valley, the stronger the military presence is. Now I'm passing through the small village of Kalsar. Harish! Hello, Marsh! I rejoin my friend Harish Kohli at the edge of the restricted zone. It looks like I can't go any further here. Not from here. You know, India and Pakistan has been in conflict for many years now. In the 1980s, Harish was a commander with the Indian military and spent time stationed on the glacier. It's a place where the fighting is not the only lethal element. So I know how the altitude affected me going over the Kardungla Pass. How is the altitude affecting the soldiers? Terrible. Absolutely terrible. Every day there are casualties not only from the bombs, but also from high altitude sickness. This conflict kept the valley close to tourists until 1994. Even now, the military keeps a close eye out for spies and terrorists traveling along this road. The sun is setting, so it's back in my car and onto my destination. The terrain's not as demanding, but the traffic's just as heavy. Okay, I've got a couple trucks that I need to get out of the way of. They certainly like to cut it close past me, probably within inches. From here, the route rapidly descends to the valley floor. And an unusually straight and flat stretch of road unfolds in front of me for the next few kilometers. Wow, seeing the Shuk River for the first time kind of feels like an oasis in the middle of all this desert. And it must have felt the same way for those weary travelers on the old Silk Road. Nubra means green, but it's almost winter now. In the summer, the river brings this valley to life. I'm about 23 kilometers from Diskit and about 3,700 meters above sea level. And the terrain has, well, I'm, I'm basically in the middle of a valley. I take a detour to cross the river the old-fashioned way. This section of the river cuts through a high-altitude desert, an amazing sight in the middle of the Himalayas. While I'm out here, I stop for a taste of what travel must have been like on the ancient Silk Road. These camels are descendants of the ones traders like Marco Polo used to pack goods over the Kardung Pass. I can't even begin to imagine traveling the road I just came over on one of these. Back on the road. Well, almost. At least the camel wouldn't have gotten stuck. It's just 16 more kilometers to Diskit. The road rises out of the valley and skims along the base of the mountains before dropping again to the valley floor. My first sign of civilization is this group of boys playing on a frozen pond. Residents of this isolated region must be self-reliant, like these boys who build their own skates from scrap wood and bits of metal. Finally, I arrive in Diskit. The population is only 500, but it is the main village of the Nubra Valley. 
Not much has changed here over the centuries. On a hill overlooking the town is the Diskit Gompa, or Buddhist monastery. For almost 600 years, it has stood as a beacon of peace, even as the war with Pakistan rages nearby. It's a welcome respite after the harrowing journey over the pass. This is one of the oldest and largest Buddhist monasteries in the Nubra Valley. It's been around since the 1420s AD. There are approximately 120 Buddhist monks living here. The religious center doubles as a school. The young boys from the village attend classes, but they also like to play on the rocks around the monastery. The customary thing to do is to sponsor the monks. And for a very little amount of money, I sponsored them for three days, all of their meals, and they insisted on doing a very special prayer. The tea they've given me is butter tea, which is made from yak's milk. It's like a salty, creamy, buttery tea. Interesting. After the ceremony, the monks enjoy the sun on the balcony. Then it's time for me to go. I bid the monks farewell with the local all-purpose word, Jule, which means hello, goodbye, please, and thank you. Thank you. Jule, Jule. <laughs> wow, truly remarkable. I've completed my 118 kilometer journey from Leh and conquered the Kardang Pass. I've experienced the thrill of one of the highest roads in the world and met people who tackle some of the most extreme conditions the earth has to offer. And despite some modern touches, the isolation and stark beauty of this region continue to define it as one of the most remarkable places on earth.